1923, there were nine of the most successful financiers in America gathered for a meeting in Chicago. 1923. They were leaders of the biggest steel industry, leaders of utility companies. One was a member of the U.S. president's cabinet, and they all gathered together, the greatest minds and masters of wealth. 25 years later, in 1948, things were much different. Many of these guys died penniless and uh, alone. A few committed suicide. Some ended up in jail. One went insane. These men who were to be the masters of wealth were really mastered by wealth, and it was problematic. And God knows it's a problem for us when wealth gets in, as he talked about the love of money being a root of all kinds of evil. And God doesn't want you and I to be foolish about wealth. He wants us to walk wisely, uh, to honor him with it so it doesn't ruin us. And the word of God has given us much to say about that. You know, over 800 times in the Bible... It talks about wealth management aspects. It's pretty important. In fact, if you dissect Jesus' teaching, you will find Jesus taught more about wealth and wealth management than any other topic in all of his ministry. Wow. More than heaven, more than hell. If you look it up, you'll find that to be true. Because he knows how much it is a part of our life, how much it can grip our hearts and steal us away from him as as Lord and Savior, and, and it just messes us up. And so we're going to look at this morning, looking at the principle of work in God's hands, the plan of wealth, how God wants you to use it, the problems we face with money, and then the promise of true riches. And we find a lot of this in Proverbs. There's great wisdom. So looking first at the principle of work uh, in God's word, you realize that the concept or the principle of work was not something that man came up with because, well, I got nothing better to do, so I might as well do something. It wasn't to curb laziness. It wasn't to just find some value in life. The very principle of work came from God himself. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible that we have in our hands, what does it say? In the beginning, God did what? Created. A, a work principle is given to us in the very first verse of, of, the, of this wonderful book that we have. And in the next six days, he worked. He created things. He worked with his hands. He spoke things into existence. And what did he say after each day? That it was good. Not only the outcome, but the process was good. And so when he created man, what did he do? He gave man this work ethic as he put him in a garden and said, keep the garden, tend the garden, and he told him to name all the animals. I mean, Mr. Adam was a uh, horticulturist, a zoologist, a biologist, incredible science degree there, you might say. Old Mick Adam's ranch was rolling along as it has, you know, there in, in the Garden of Eden. And then sin came in. Sin came in and took what God said was good and made it a problem brought pain to it. Listen to Genesis 3, verse 17 and 19. Said, the Lord said, Cursed is the ground because of you, speaking to Adam, through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. That's why you guys get this Monday morning blues. I don't want to go to work today. I don't like my job. That's why you get it. Blame it on sin. Blame it on Adam and Eve. <laughs> they messed it all up. That's why it, we have so much problems with work rather than finding a real pleasure in it because sin messed us up from the very beginning. It messed up our purpose for doing work. It was created for us to glorify God through our time and energy and it turned us inward that, well, what's in it for me? It messed up our motives in work instead of looking at this as a way to worship the Lord. Well, now it becomes that we see greed and covetousness and selfishness come in in our motives. It messed up even our end goal from work, where wealth just was a tool. To now it became what we live for, as the saying goes, he who dies with the most toys wins. You really don't win, by the way, if that's your motto in life. You don't win. Because of sin, our work ethic and how we deal with money is marred. And so we see it throughout the book of Proverbs. We see these things. How is it marred? Number one, we see greediness. 
Look at Proverbs chapter 15. You can turn there. Proverbs 15, verse 27. Great proverb there. He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Greediness is going to bring trouble upon you and your house. Where you're just not content. You always got to have more. And greediness has a close pal by the name of laziness. Where greed says, I want, laziness says, I won't. Look at Proverbs 21, a couple pages more, verse 25 and 26. The desire of the lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. The lazy man looks to cut corners. The righteous man, on the other hand, is a giver, finds contentment and peace, and he's got this freedom he's just, he's, as he's giving out things. Another problem of our heart is dishonesty. Dishonesty says, I will, but do it my way. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. Here on the screen, we find that the Lord ain't very happy with shady business dealings. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. And we've all run across shady practices in business. People have done that to try to rip others off. And in biblical days, you had scales, and they would weigh it out. And, and you'd have to, you know, sometimes if a guy was a crook, he would tip the scales in his favor. That's where that, that saying comes from. And he'd, it, it, the seller would rip off the buyer through the process, and yet the Lord sees those things. Proverbs 21, verse 6, a fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. Not worth it. Proverbs 20, verse 17, food gained by fraud tastes sweet, but one ends up with a mouth full of gravel. <laughs> How shady is that dealing? You know, it is sweet at first, all oh, this is good, but your mouth's going to be full of rocks eventually. It ain't going to be tasty. Proverbs 22, 16, one who oppresses the poor to increase his wealth and one who gives gifts to the rich, both come to poverty so that the shady deal ends up falling apart and you lose. So we see greediness, laziness, dishonesty, and another one that comes out of the heart is idolatry, this love of money where we think we are so secure because of what we have. Well, look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. No one is able to buy their way out of judgment when it comes to that day. Jesus paid a price, yes. His blood will cover us, but to think on that day, well, I'll just write God a blank check. I will just show him all of my wealth. Ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. Money can buy a lot of things, but it definitely cannot buy salvation. So God's design and work is not a bad thing, but sin messed us up. It messed up our motives, our purpose, and our end goal in working. But the hope is, the truth of God's word is, where sin messed us up, now the Bible comes to bring us and set us right. Look at the New Testament counsel that we find. Ephesians 4.28, we find giving instead of dishonesty. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. So a redeemed life is living in the truth. You're providing for others, and you're being productive and helping out. It's a good counter to it. First uh, Timothy 6, 17 through 19, Paul tells the, the rich, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So our hope is in God, our provider, not our, our funds that we have in hand. You can be free to do rich and good deeds and to bless others and store up rewards in heaven. Colossians 3 deals with our motive, telling us that everything now becomes an act of worship instead of just a job to do. Look at what it says in verse 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, 
since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. God makes a difference in the life, not just spiritually, also practically, in these daily things. Proverbs 11, 20, 28 says, Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. We have a different source of life. That's Jesus. And so we can look at wealth as simply a tool that is used to glorify God in my life and in the lives of others. So, you just get that paycheck from work. What do you do with it? What do you do? How do you make that paycheck work wisely for God's design and purposes in your life? If you look at chapter 10, verse 4 of Proverbs, we read this counsel there. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A slack hand would be an idle hand. You might also say it's a, a loose hand where there's lots of impulse buying, no thought to the cost, neglecting those more important matters. You know, when you kind of get out there and you say, you know what, I, I, I can't pay rent, but man, I got this cool lava lamp for my room. It is sweet. That, that's not looking at money too right. You need to pay your rent, you need to take care of the bills and save some money for that special lava lamp you want. It's been said that what we need is not more dollars, but more cents, S-E-N-S-E. How do we use this money rightly? Well, Proverbs gives us six things to consider, six ways to be wise with wealth. How do I do, what do I do with that paycheck when it comes? Number one, the first wise way is to worship God with it what we consider tithe. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Tithing is not for God's sake, it's for ours. He already owns everything. So what does tithing do? It's an act of worship to God. You're not paying club dues. You're not giving to a bank that you withdraw later. It's simply a worship to the Lord, no strings attached because he's that good. Secondly, tithing releases my heart from the pull of materialism that's on me everywhere. I'm choosing to say, God, you matter more than anything in this life. You've saved me. Number three, it's a witness to the world that my God's a giver, not a taker. He's a blesser of men. And number four, it helps me to be part of expanding his kingdom. I'm reaching more with his gospel, storing up riches for eternity. And people say, so how much should I tithe? Well, the very word tithe means 10%. That's what it comes from. It was an Old Testament figured amount. Actually, we have closer evaluation. You find in the Old Testament that it was closer to 25% of an income was actually given out. 25%. There was festivals. There was the regular tithe. There was special uh, 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 times. There were the Levitical portion, things like that. I mean, up to 25%. The New Testament doesn't give a figure. It just says to give cheerfully, or as 2 Corinthians 9 says, to give hilariously. That's a better word for us. So excited, I'm just laughing my way as I give. That much fun. Because Christ has made us a new creation, and godliness isn't measured by a legal aspect, it's measured from a loving heart. The heart is what matters most. In fact, God would say, keep your money if you can't give it with the right heart because I'm after the heart more than the money. He's after our hearts. He wants us. But 10% is just a starting point, not a ceiling to get to. And if tithing isn't a habit in your life, I want to encourage you just to start small. I was meeting one day with a, a lady with some business stuff we were dealing with, and she was telling me about sales, and she said, you know, when I reach a million dollars of sales, I'm going to start giving to the church. And I said, no, you won't. And she was shocked. as a pastor telling her this. She said, well, why? I said, because if you can't be faithful with what you have in your hands now, you'll never be faithful with more. And that's the truth. So when that paycheck comes, the first thing I do is I, 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 I tithe as an act of worship to the Lord. Secondly, provide for personal needs. That is my family... Speaking of parents and kids, Proverbs eleven twenty nine: 29, 
Whoever brings ruin on their family will inherit only wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. Don't trouble your own house financially. In the end, you end up with nothing, and you end up a fool. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul just chopped you down. He says, one of your first responsibilities is provide for your house, believer. I don't have to provide for my parents. Yeah, you do. You have the first responsibility to provide for them. Amen, parents? <laughs> you have that responsibility, but here's this reality that we face in life. I must balance the responsibility to provide for my family with this temptation that always says more and better. You will always have more and better knocking on your door. My kids need that new. My wife needs this. I sure would like that tool or computer gadget because what kind of parent would I be if I didn't get those things? And you have to balance that out with. As a parent, you and I are called to provide for our family, not always pamper our family. There's a big difference. Yes, in your heart, you want to give them everything. But there's times to say no. And there's times to put limitation. Pampering should come sporadically, not regularly, because you don't want to raise spoiled brats. You know, your old mama said it the right way. Money ain't, doesn't grow on trees. I don't know how many times I've said that to my kids. Money doesn't grow on trees. And you go, man, that's what my mom said. <laughs> it comes back, right? Number three with money, remember the poor. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. The one who scatters yet increases, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So giving out actually brings in more. The generous soul is made rich spiritually, rich emotionally, maybe even financially, but at the end of your life you're going to be saying, wow, how blessed it was as I lived for the Lord. It's a good thing. Look at, read Proverbs uh, 14, uh, verse 31. Look at what that says. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. There's a direct connection with honoring the Lord and showing mercy to those in need. Look at Proverbs 14, 21. He who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. Proverbs 19, verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. What a great promise. Proverbs 22, verse 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. And we see that example even in the New Testament. As Paul even asked the Gentile churches, as he took a collection to take it back to the believers in Jerusalem who were going through a real struggle. And they did that. And so remembering the poor was a part of it. Every budget, I believe, should make room for helping others in need practically. You decide, but make it a line in your budget. I want to remember this, not so tight that I cannot minister to a friend or person in need in some capacity. If it's too tight, you need to adjust. Why? Because you don't own the money, it's God's. You're just a steward of it. And when you're a steward of it, there's a fully different approach to how do you, as the owner, want me to use this funds. So we need to look at it rightly. Be faithful, be wise, be flexible to what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Number four, so you've tithed on it, you've provided for the needs of your family, you're remembering the poor. Number four, expand God's kingdom. There's a difference between tithes and offerings. Tithes are given in an act of worship to, in a sense, your local church as a place where you come and you worship the Lord, the glory of God. Offerings are those separate special things that you look to expand the kingdom of God in, in a unique way. Maybe they come in very sporadically or very, very isolated times. You know, kids going to camp, that's an offering. You know, uh, I, I want to support this missionary, that's an offering to the Lord. That's on top of, not in placement of my tithes. So if you've ever thought, well, you know what, uh, you know, I don't want to give it to the church. I'm just going to give it to the poor. That's not a tithe. 
That's an offering. It's on top of it. These are used in various ways. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 7. There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. Span the kingdom of God. Look at Proverbs 14, 4. I love this verse. It's one of my favorites. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Listen, your goal in life is not easy living, it's right living. And in some facets, you want to make a mess of, for Jesus of what you have. You want to get some oxen, plow some field, make some profit so that I can expand the kingdom of God. It's a good thing to have. Number five, save for the future. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. And that's where most of the wealth comes in, by working for it. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, why does it go to grandkids and not to kids? You ever thought about that? Because the kids have made a mess already and are driving the parents nuts. So the, <laughs> they skip a generation. Grandkids can do no wrong, right? <laughs> Anyways. So he tells us there in verse 22, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Some wealth may come from inheritance. Proverbs 20, verse 21, An inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. Hey, if, if you came into an inheritance, be careful. Be easily wasted. You know, get some godly counsel first before you start with the headaches. Proverbs 21, verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So plan and profit, and you be hasty, you reap the results. Uh, another one here, Proverbs 21, verse 20, the wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. They're living for the moment to fill the belly. They're not thinking about anything for the future. In fact, I read an article recently about uh, an article about an older generation, what they would tell the younger generation financially. And the number one thing in the article was start saving early. Because we think younger, hey, I got all the time in the world. Next thing you know, you're like, oops. Start saving. You know, in the, in the article they were talking about, you put, set aside $100 a month when you're 17 years old. By the time you hit retirement age, it's, it's close to a million. We always kick ourselves. Man, I wish I would have started sooner. Because time flies. So save for the future. And number six, use wise and godly business practices, even with that. Look at this, Proverbs 18, verse 16. To make friends with it. Hmm. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. Is the Bible encouraging bribery? No. He's saying being wise with the finances you have. Because wealth is a powerful tool. You can use it in a good way, you can use it in a bad way. Used in a good way, you can add value to all your relationships. Used in a right way. Inroads, maybe even into business opportunities and, and influence. You know, you think about it. When a company decides to give to a charity, there are people watching that and say, hey, I like that, I like that value that they just did. I want to work with them too. That's that principle at stake. So tithing and worship, providing for family, giving to the poor, expanding God's kingdom, saving for the future, using it wisely in business practices, what happens is you leave a good and godly witness in the lives of others. Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. That's the legacy you want. So what are the pitfalls and problems that we have? There are four dangers we find in here, and four dangers that you and I probably know real well, but just to note them, the first is we end up placing our hope in the wealth. Proverbs 23, 4, and 5. Do not weary yourself, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Amen? We see it happen. Some people are lazy and won't work. Other people overwork 
and won't rest, and they wear themselves out. And both are unhealthy. But he says, don't set your hope on the riches, because they're just going to fly away. You ever had those times? We've all had those times where all of a sudden this crazy check comes in the mail, and you're like, woohoo, I just got a refund I didn't know about, and this, that, and the other. And then there's a part of you that goes, uh-oh. If that came in, what's going to happen next? Something's going to break. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's that mentality we have. Uh, so you either trick the system and spend it right away, <laughs> or you go, you know what, this is how God has provided for that particular thing. I had no idea the fridge would die out tomorrow, and look at this, come in and provide. Thank you, Lord. You work in great ways. But money was never meant to be where our hope is. It's solely responsible to the Lord. The danger of placing your hope in it. The second danger we face is getting in debt from it. Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. The debt becomes really a slavery. And for most of us, it becomes that consumer debt. You know, it's so easy. Oh, you need that? Amazon? Click, click, click. Done. We go to Costco. It really should be called cost yo, because it's going to cost yo a lot, right? <laughs> Warning signs out there. All ye who enter, <laughs> be warned. You know, because it's so easy, and I've made my own stupid decisions financially. I remember one time my dad had this really cool truck, and, uh, and, I, and he was going to sell it. I said, I'll just, I'll just buy it from you, Dad. Buy the truck off, and what I did is I took my, a line of credit on my house to well, pay for the truck because hey, I'll just roll it right in. Stupid, stupid me. I'm not getting on you if you did that, but let me just consider these things. You've taken a car that should have been paid off for five years, and you've extended it for 30 30 years. Who owns a car for 30 years? Who wants to pay on a car for 30 years? That ain't worth it. And so I sold off the thing. I took the hit and learned my lesson. But debt is definitely problematic. It's so easy to get into. It's so harder to get out. It takes time and effort. Third problem we have is when our expenses become greater than our income, we're living beyond our means. Look at Proverbs 22. Verse 26 and 27. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is surety for debts, if you have nothing with which to pay. Why should he take away your bed from under you? Don't promise what you can't fulfill. My personal rule, a couple rules I have, is, is number one is I don't want to buy anything that I can't pay back in a few years. I'm talking about you know, bigger things, just a few years. Because to me, it's just, it's not worth it. It's not worth the stress. It's not worth buying that thing that I think is so precious. I end up like Smeagol with my little ring. It's not my precious. And it's going to kill you. It's going to ruin your family. It's not worth it. The second rule I have is create a budget and stick to it. Stick to it. You're not competing with your neighbors. It's been said that we buy things we can't afford. You've heard this saying before, right? We buy things we can't afford with money we don't have, to impress people we don't like. And most of the stuff we can do without. I was reading an article in 2019, the USA Today put out an article. The average American, listen, the average American spends $18,000 a year in non-essentials. $1,500 a month in non-essentials. And you say, what are non-essentials? It's everything from going out to eat at restaurants, to lunches, to this uh, uh, subscription to that streaming service, to this coffee over here, to this $18,000. And again, if that's not problematic, only if you're not saving, you haven't done plan for the future, and you say, I can't save. Well, if you really looked at it, you probably could. Plan for the future well as a steward of God's resources. Be careful of living beyond our means. The fourth one that's danger to us is chasing the fantasies, the gambling, the get-rich schemes. Proverbs 12, verse 11. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. That's true. Some people hit the casinos every time they get a paycheck in hopes to make it big, and hopefully they don't spend their rent. You know what's crazy is the U.S. leads the world in gambling losses, $117 billion a year. Per year. All trying to win. A lot lost in the process. I encourage you just 
hard work pays off. Chasing those schemes shows that you're not managing your money right. So in light of all this, we've got to remember as we kind of close out with this section, the promise of the true riches in Christ. Turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 22. This is one to underline if you've got a pen. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Your true wealth lies in your relationship with the Lord. Because of Jesus, Ephesians 1 says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have been adopted into his family because of Jesus. You have been called his child, an heir of the kingdom of God. You have been given heaven and eternity. You have a chance to store up rewards in heaven for the glory of Christ. And the Bible says in Matthew, Jesus says that, there is, that, that moth can't destroy it and rust can't inhibit it. It won't lose its value. It goes up in value. That's a good thing. Mark 8, verse 36, Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What a perspective. Living for the kingdom and the king to come. I'd rather be poor on this earth all my days and rich for all eternity in heaven because he who has Christ has everything that really matters. And we have to keep that priority. One last verse out of Proverbs 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. It's good insight. Lord, keep me humble. Help me to put you first and you'll take care of my life. I like that. It's a simple way to look at things. Or as Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So the question I leave you with is, can you be faithful with what God's put in your hands today? Or are you always looking for more? Be faithful in the now. Be wise with the portion that he's given you. And recognize that your true wealth is found in the spiritual riches of Christ who's made you a part of his family. Thank you.